Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Alan Lovell. Uh, I am not the speaker you came to hear, but I am with the APH Connect Center and Family Connect. Uh, FamilyConnect.org is a uh, informational suite uh, of, of uh, resources put together and made available to you through the American Printing House for the Blind. Now, that is an earful, but uh, APHConnectCenter.org will land you uh, at all of our resource pages. That is Family Connect, uh, APH Career Connect, and Vision Aware. Each one of those resources are curated around the needs of different demographics, but of course, Family Connects, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and we are happy to have Sarah and Julia, Sarah Edwards and Julia Bowman uh, with us today. And uh, what's fascinating about them, I have worked with Sarah before. She's helped us with other webinars um, during the start of this global pandemic to help us with educating our kids at home with simple items around the house. Uh, the unique thing about both of these ladies is that they are first parents of visually impaired children. Both of them turned teacher of the visually impaired. Uh, so what is so fascinating about that to me is that you get both the professional opinion and the familial uh, side of things. And they have uh, been, they're both instructors at the Illinois School for the Visually Impaired. And um, so today they're gonna talk to you about TVI and, uh, and of course, items in the home, simple solutions for your uh, child's instruction who might have CVI. And I'm going back and forth between these acronyms. I hope I didn't mess them up, of course. CVI, cortical visual impairment, TVI, teacher of the visually impaired. Uh, so I will, um, if the questions do not get too bogged down, we'll try to wait until midway through their presentation uh, to open it up for questions. Um, but if, if we have uh, relative questions that pop up, uh, Leanne, who has been speaking to you first, will interrupt and uh, let us know um, the types of questions that we're getting. Otherwise, we'll do halfway through, then we'll follow up there towards the end of their presentation. So Sarah and Julia, uh, you guys can take the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I will start off just by uh, introducing myself again. I am Sarah Edwards and I work in the Birth to Three program at the Illinois School for the Visually Impaired. Um, I work with Julia, who I'll let um, she introduce herself, but uh, we are basically the two um, staff members in the Birth to Three program, so we cover a, a great portion, <clears throat> excuse me, of of Illinois, basically everything outside of Chicago is our area between the both of us. Um, I have two children, um, Ethan is 17 and Elis is 15, and they were both born with Lieber's congenital amaurosis, so they have light perception. And I am going to now kick it back to Julie, who will introduce herself, and then we will get started. Hi, I'm Julia Bowman. I um, am Sarah's partner in Birth to Three at ISBI. We both worked for ISBI for about 10 years. And prior to that, I got my master's in special education, teaching students with visual impairments from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So it was a move and also a career change for me um, when I moved to Illinois. Um, that career change came, it was inspired by my ex own experiences as a parent. So my daughter, Mary, and I were part of the Perkins Infant Toddler Program. And we also had a teacher of the visually impaired, a birth to three teacher coming to our home. And that was just such a powerful and positive experience that I've spent my whole career in birth to three. And um, we hope that we can give you both that parent and teacher perspective as we share our ideas with you today. Okay, so did you want to just go ahead and go to the first slide then? We see it. You're ready to go. Okay, so this is more of continuing to introduce myself. Uh, this is Mary, my daughter. She was 10 months in the picture on the left and the one on the right is more current. She's 16 now and on the left she was just starting to use her vision. Her primary diagnosis 
at that age was CVI. She does now have other ocular impairments, but CVI was really what shaped her visual functioning. It shaped my experience as a parent and it has shaped my experience as a teacher. And I wrote more about that experience on the AF APH Family Connect website in the blog. Um, if you are able to read that article, I hope that my shared experience can give you some information that would be helpful. If you're not able to read it, I just wanna let you know that little changes that you make in your child's daily routine can really make a big difference in terms of visual functioning. And we hope that we can give you some ideas on how to do that today. Okay. So we're just very quickly going to do a basic review of what is CBI. Um, we've heard that later in the week or you know, very soon we'll be having some interviews on the APH Family Connect website from experts in the field, um, Christine Roman, Amanda Lewick. So you'll get much more of that background information from their interviews. We're just going to go right to strategies after a very quick review. So what is CBI? CVI is a temporary or permanent disruption of the visual pathways. It is not an ocular condition, it is a neurological condition. And you can think of it as a processing or perception issue. Okay, we also wanted to review the 10 characteristics just very quickly. Um, these are the visual behaviors that have been observed in children with CVI, and they are the basis for the CVI range assessment that many TVIs perform. Um, these, for the parents out there, these characteristics may affect your children to different extents. So some may be very important and some um, may affect them very little. So just keep them in mind as we go forward. And one more thing to review, we wanted to just look at um, the CVI phases. The CVI phases are correlated with your child's CVI range score. Um, and I just want to mention, I gave them each of the phases my own personal description. Um, uh, that's just my own liberty there. You can, just because so many TVIs use this assessment, we thought it would be um, helpful to organize our talk by the phases. So we'll present activities for children in each of the phases and looking at those goals, learning to look, learning new skills and learning literacy. Okay, so in phase one, a child with CVI is learning to look. Our focus and our goal is to encourage those consistent looking behaviors. You know, encourage prolonged fixations. So some of the adaptations we make for children in phase one are using objects of a single solid color, removing all complexity that includes visual, auditory, and positional. And what I mean by positional complexity is finding that position where a child is comfortable and relaxed and not fighting gravity so that he or she can just focus on using vision. We do use light to highlight objects. We use movement to gain visual attention. Movement is so alerting. Um, and we start in the peripheral fields. Now, Again, for the parents out there, you need to think about your child's individual visual functioning situation. So for many kids, the peripheral fields are stronger, but you need to think about, does that apply to your child or not? Think about using the strongest visual field. And finally, we use we present items at, at near rather than distance. Um, at near, then objects will take up a greater portion of the visual field. So this is really more of a complexity issue when we think about that. Items taking up more of a more of your visual field, you don't have as much to process. That same object held at distance will compete with all of the other objects in the room. So then that's just more visual processing, more that the child has to perceive. Third, phase one play environment. We've removed all of the visual complexity. You know, we have the black background and the black play mat. All of the objects are of a single solid color. Um, you could even re remove all but one of the objects. You, know, you could make it even simpler. But this is just play. Um, play is not the only thing that your child does throughout the day. So how are we going to encourage and support the use of vision throughout the rest of our child's day? Well, we wanna take a good look at our routines and think of them as opportunities for looking. So children with CVI can use their vision most efficiently if objects are presented within the context of a routine. 
the routines are structured and they're predictable and they help children make sense of what they're looking at. They also have the advantage of repetition. If children are repeatedly exposed to the same objects throughout their daily routines, then they can build that familiarity. They can process them over and over and it can become easier and more efficient for them to view them. And finally, just thinking ahead in, you know, in terms of literacy, we're gonna get there, but vocabulary has more meaning in the context of a routine. So now I just wanna give you a few examples of how you can just make little changes, as I said in the beginning, just these little changes to your daily routines that can help your child use his or her vision to the maximum extent. Um, these are pictures taken from the CVI Journey website, but they are examples that have been used by several families that I've worked with, with good success. So on the top, you see a shiny red gift bow on a spoon for feeding. And you know it doesn't have to be the shiny gift bow. It could be streamers. It could be a scrunchie. It could be a little pen light. Anything that your child would respond to that you think would gain visual attention. Um, and it doesn't have to be red. It can be whatever color your child responds to. So that's one way. Um, you can also, if you're going for a walk, give your child something to look at while you're in that complex visual environment of being outside. You know, so you see on the lower picture, there's a Mylar balloon tied to the stroller. Well, if you don't have a Mylar balloon, you can really attach any object that your child might be interested in viewing if you have these handy links that they just link to the stroller and your child probably has something to look at while you're going for a walk. I listed a couple more examples here, but then I also wanted to tell you about some really creative ideas I had from some of the families I've worked with. Um, one family hung holiday lights from their child's G2 bag stand, and they used this during night feedings. So then when the house was dark and quiet, this child had an opportunity to look at the lights and really focus and really use her vision. Another example, I have a little friend who spends time on a wedge um, to be in prone. And that's part of his PT routine. But what we found was this was a really relaxing, comfortable position for him because he has a busy body. He's, his body moves around a lot when he's on his back. So on his back wasn't a, a great position for him, but prone was. So we took that opportunity. Um, his mom had this wonderful red spaghetti strainer that he looked at while he was in that position. So you really need to think about your routine from your child's perspective. So what are the parts of the day where you can incorporate vision? How does your child perceive what's going on throughout the day and how can you modify that to make it more visually accessible? Okay, so now I wanna switch gears and talk about light. Light is one of the greatest supports that we can use for children with CVI. It's a very, very motiv motivating visual target and we can use it both as the visual target and to highlight visual targets. So here in these two pictures, we see um, the use of light as a visual target. The little guy on the left is looking at his family Christmas tree. He's looking at the lights on the tree and he's positioned so that he can see the tree in his strongest visual field and he can be there with his family, you know, and just enjoy this time together and have an opportunity to look. On the right, that's my daughter, Mary, again. Um, she's looking at the APH light box. And she's actually showing you a little bit of phase two skill there while she's hitting a switch to turn the light box off and on. But I had to show this picture. I had to share it because the light box was one of the very first things she ever looked at. And this gel, not the red one, not the yellow one, the bubbles. This was the gel that really motivated her to look and helped her to improve her visual functioning significantly. So we can also use light to highlight other objects. And when we pair light with objects that have movement properties, we can make them very visually motivating. So I love slinkies very dearly. I use them a lot. Um, this slinky is just placed on a black background and light is highlighting it. Um, you could also hang it, bounce it up and down and shine the light up through it just to make that, you know, that moving um, attractive visual target. Anything that shines, sparkles, or is reflective is going to be a good uh, target to be paired with light in order to motivate children in phase one to look. If you don't have access to an APH light box, you can make one. So I have a link that will take you to a PDF file, and this file has step-by-step -step directions with photos 
that'll teach you how to make your own light box. And this is very simple. It's basically a Rubbermaid tote with some rope lights. You have some hot glue and some foil. Um, it's pretty inexpensive. And it, it, as I said, it's pretty simple. And it will allow you to do some very motivating activities for a child in phase one. So if, when you do have a light box, you can look around your house and you might have some of these items that you could place on the light box. I have my glitter jar that is just water, food coloring, and glitter. But the movement of the glitter makes it a motivating visual target. And just simply rolling it on the light box could make that motivating for a child in phase one to look. You notice it's green. So this, my little guy that I made this bottle for, he responds very strongly to green. So again, always thinking about the individual child. Um, we also have some popsicles that did not make it into the freezer. And they're just lovely. They have that nice movement property if you wanna move them around. They're nice and squishy. They're translucent, brightly colored, and they have the additional property of being just the right size for little hands when we're looking to move into phase two. And with that, I'm gonna let Sarah take over. Okay, now that your child has shown some strong and consistent visual skills, such as fixation and tracking, then we're ready to move into phase two. So in phase two, we are going to be integrating function with vision. In other words, I like to think that our children become more active participants. They're not just looking at something or watching something as we present materials in front of them and determine how long they can fixate on something or track horizontally or vertically, but we're actually going to integrate or incorporate more activities where they are encouraged to be active participants and using their vision um, to complete activities and to participate in daily routines. And by doing so, they're going to use their vision, they're going to look at something and think, I want to interact with that, right? And in order to do so, that will motivate some reach and that will um, bring on some tactile exploration, some visual exploration and some more cause and effect play. So some strategies that we will use in phase two are expanding use of those 10 characteristics that Julie shared with you. Of course, we're going to keep in mind what your children's visual preferences are, but we're going to use those and expand those with new objects, or um, maybe we're going to introduce objects with more colors in addition to their preferred color. We're going to increase the repertoire of their visual targets. Things aren't going to be as simple as they were in phase one. We want to increase that complexity just a little bit in order to encourage more interaction. And like I said, they will um, have more opportunities to interact with objects and environment. They will become more active participants during play and exploration. And in doing so, we'll introduce new concepts and skills. So there'll be some concept development with these activities, such as in, out, off, on, some more body awareness. So from here on, I will share some activities that will all promote that, <clears throat> excuse me, that reaching that pairing look and touch and really using that vision to interact more. And we'll start with the light box since that's where Julie left off. So whether you have an APH light box or the one that you make, there's many activities we can include. <clears throat> one is we bring out the slinky. Everybody likes the slinkies. We can attach the slinky to the top of the handle of the light box and let it hang. And as it hangs, it's illuminated by the, the light box and then it's moving. So that, in, again, encourages your child to reach out, bat, or maybe grasp at the slinky. So there's some um, motivation to interact with that slinky rather than just watch it. You can also wrap the end of the slinky on your child's wrist to encourage some arm movement. So while it's attached to their arm and they're moving their arm back and forth, they're actually engaged in some cause and effect play. I move my arm, the slinky moves, and I'm watching that slinky move back and forth. We um, like to use sensory bags. I have a picture here of a sensory bag full of water beads or Orbeez. Um, those are great to put on a light box surface. And if anybody knows me, I would prefer the water beads inside the bag where I can't actually feel them. Um, I don't like them directly. So I like to have those inside a bag, but those make a great sensory bag on the light box. 
You can also use other materials. I prefer um, to use hair gel, clear hair gel from like the dollar store and a couple drops of food coloring. So you can use your child's preferred color, whatever their color may be, and um, color a bag of hair gel to their preferred color, put that on the light box, and that encourages them to reach out and pair some look and touch. You can also use finger paint, make a couple or just put a couple dabs of finger paint inside a, a Ziploc baggie, close it up, put that on the light box and let them move the paint around. You can play with Jello or other food substances like yogurt or pudding. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can obviously, you know, I would put like saran wrap or something on top of the light box surface so that you're not putting that food directly on um, the light box. And then as they move that food around, um, they're pairing that look and touch again. Playing with the food, whether it's jello or pudding, they're also getting some smell, they're getting some tactile exploration. And then we also really don't have any worries if they bring that to their mouth. And then that's rewarding too as well as they taste um, what they're playing with. <clears throat> we can use clear Tupperware or Ikea bowls. Um, I don't know how well these will show up, but these bowls are from Ikea. They're great because they're transparent. They come in different colors. Um, so these are great for a light box. Um, Olay, did you have a question? Okay, I wasn't sure. Olay came in. Um, you can use those clear Tupperware bowls or Ikea bowls to use for sorting and counting. You can scatter Cheerios, goldfish, or puffs on the light box so then um, your ch child or student can visually search for the food item, pair, look, and touch, grab it, put it in their mouth, and they get a reward. To go back to finger paint, if you don't want the finger paint inside the Ziploc baggie, you can actually put parchment paper on the light box surface, put some finger paint down, and let your child or student go at it, and they can have fun and finger paint a piece of art. And toys with any space or holes like the O-ball, those are great for light box activities since the, the light comes through those spaces. Um, I wish I had a picture to share, but I wasn't able to get the release. Um, I like the O-balls that have the actual bells or balls inside, and I hang that in front of the light box. And then as the student reaches out and back at the O-ball, they actually get some auditory feedback as well. So materials that are great for the light box in phase two obviously are transparent or translucent. Um, here we have an image of those gel bags I was discussing earlier. You can make those in any color. Um, in the smaller size bags, I would suggest only putting maybe a drop or two at most of the food coloring. Um, I just had a family this morning that said, yeah, I think I put too much food coloring because we really couldn't see the light through. So you really don't need that much. Um, you can also add materials inside those gel bags, you know, to make it a little more interesting, like beads or, or glitter even. Um, I also like to use window gel clings. You can buy these at a dollar store. Um, they work great on the light box. And while your child or student reaches out and touches, they also get some tactile exploration because they are a little bit squishy. So if you're, you know, you have some texture resistance, um, those are fun to play around with. Magnet tiles, um, and I have, yeah, you have a question? Um, real quick, how do you know how bright to set the light box? I'm sorry, what? How? How bright to set the light box? How bright do we set the light box? I think depends on your child or student. I mean, I have some students I work with that really can't tolerate the bright light. Um, I just read their, their physical cues or, you know, verbal, vocal cues. And I think you can tell what they're comfortable with and what they're willing um, to tolerate as far as brightness. Okay, so magnet tiles to go back, those are not um, the most inexpensive toys, unfortunately, but they are great if you can get your hands on them. Um, like I was mentioning before, the next few slides, I actually do have images of all this if you're not. Um, completely sure of what we're talking about. But magnet tiles are great because they're transparent. They come in different shapes. Um, you can build towers or um, 
yeah, and they have some shape, or and they also come in different colors. So you have shape and color recognition as well. Tissue paper, I like to use a lot of tissue paper. Um, but I'm talking about like the gift bag paper. I make a lot of window collages or pictures with my students. I simply get a piece of parchment paper or a piece of white paper, put that on the light box, and then I um, give my students different colors of tissue paper so they can rip the tissue paper, crumple up the tissue paper because there's so many hand and finger skill, you know, to go into that activity. And then we glue or tape that tissue paper onto the clear paper to make like a collage or some type of um, window picture. You can get templates. So let's say it's for like a border. So with it becoming fall, you could get a leaf template and provide orange and yellow tissue paper and have them crumple up and tear paper and paste those on within that template. And they've created a leaf that they can then um, visually um, see with the help of a light box. Clear cups with drawings, I do have a picture coming up. This is just clear solo cups and Sharpie, you know, uh, markers can draw pictures. Then you put those on the light box and you have lanterns. Colored reusable ice cubes, I use these all of the time. Um, I, again, I get these at the dollar store and you can get them in different shapes. Um, they come in different colors. So depending on what skills we're working at, maybe it's just um, placing objects in, in a container and taking them out. They're small, so they're great for hand. Maybe it's um, matching and sorting by color. Maybe it's matching and sorting by shape because we can get these in different shapes. Um, you, can, you can freeze them if you want. I do have a family that their little one does prefer them to be cold. So there's an added sensory piece there or you can just keep them at room temperature. Um, and of course, colored stones and beads are always great to use on the light box in phase two as well. Here I have some pictures on the left is a picture of a little boy using a handmade light box. And as you can see, there are those colored stones that we were just talking about and some colored transparent cups off to the side. So he could be participating in some type of matching or sorting activity. Um, and then on the top right are the magnet tiles that I was um, sharing with you. Like I said, you can build towers. Those are great for kids to reach out and knock down. Everybody likes to knock down the tower before they start learning how to build. But that integrating um, some function with vision. I see it, I want to knock it down and um, it directs my reach. And then in the bottom right, we have the gel clings. In this picture, we'll start on the left with the four pictures that form a square. In the top left is some sand art. A child is completing and pushing around some different colored sand on the light box. And then as we move clockwise, then we have a child sorting those colored beads by color. And then as we move down, that's an example of somebody finger painting using the light box. And then the last picture in the lower Left is somebody pouring and scooping colored water on the light box surface. The top right image are those clear solo cups I was telling you about. You can um, color those, draw pictures, and then put those on the light box surface and they light up like little lanterns. I like this activity because you can actually involve the siblings of the children you work with. They can draw the cup, you know, draw on the cups or color the cups for their brothers and sisters. And then in the bottom right, I have the ice cubes, those reusable ice cubes I was telling you about that can be found at the dollar stores. So we'll move on to the O-balls. I know that we both mentioned O-balls a couple times. They're, they're great toys um, for little hands to grasp when they're starting to, you know, to learn how to hold on to something. Um, so with the O-balls, we can extend your child's visual preferences like we were talking about. We're expanding. We're going to use those visual preferences, but, um, you know, gradually move up to a little more complexity. So, for example, if your child really likes those shiny reflective surfaces like the Mylar paper, um, then we can fill that, that O-ball with that Mylar paper to help them um, or to help gain their visual attention to the O-ball that may be new um, and 
they're not necessarily comfortable with looking at it quite yet so that mylar paper will gain their visual attention and then hopefully it will encourage them to reach out and grab that O-ball um, and interact with it. On the right, we have an O-ball filled with scarves. So this will promote some cause and effect play. They use their vision to reach out for the scarves, pull the scarf out. So in this activity, like I mentioned, they will involve get involved in some more cause and effect purposeful play in phase two. Rattles. So we can make rattles with so many things found within the home. Um, I will go from left to right. On the left is a rattle made out of plastic spoons um, and an egg and some tape. So within that egg, you can put anything you want that makes sound. You can use coins, you can use you know, dried rice, dried pasta, dried beans, beads, um, rocks, whatever it is that you have that, that will shake, you can put within that egg, put it in between those two spoons and tape it, you have a rattle. The one in the middle is just a straw and some aluminum foil or mylar piper attached to the straw. Have a rattle. The third, the third one on your far right is a rattle made out of a water bottle. Again, you can add any of those materials I've mentioned and I, you'll hear me mention them again and again is the dried pasta, beans, rocks, coins, beads, put those in the water bottle. You can add um, shiny reflective materials in there as well to gain your child's visual attention. Seal the cap and then tape on a handle. You've created a rattle. So rattles are great because again, it encourages them to reach out and tactually explore, hold something in their hands, and in addition, they will get that auditory, um, they will get some auditory feedback as they play with the rattle um, and some cause and effect purposeful play because as they shake the rattle, they are creating um, some sound. Tie tins. There's um, such a wide variety of activities to do with pie tins. Um, so one of the most basic uses of a pie tin during um, many of the sessions I have with my families is just using a pie tin as a container. A shallow container um, when we're working on concept development such as in and out. So if your child's um, you know, visual preferences again is that shiny reflective material, it gets their attention um, and we want to engage them in a more um, interactive activity, I'll use a pie pan. And it's shallow so again we're not um, asking them to reach into a really deep bowl or a deep container that might be difficult for them and then they won't be rewarded as frequently. We really want them to have success. So a shallow pipe pan is great for container play and just that concept development of in and out. You can also make tambourines with pie tins. Um, just two pie tins is all you need and those materials quizzy at the end about what I'm <laughs> dried rice, dried beans, pasta, rocks, coins, whatever you have that makes a sound, fill a pie, um, a pie tin with um, whatever material you have, take another pie tin, secure those, whether, you know, glue, tape, stable, staples, however you want to secure those, and you have a tambourine that your child can hold and shake you know, they're using their vision and they're pairing that with touch um, and they're, they're engaged in more interactive play. Uh, you can also add pythons to mobiles, um, like the little rooms or the dangle bars that we often talk about, or you make a mobile out of PVC pipe. You can simply hang two pythons together. So when your child uses their vision to direct their reach to bat and to reach out and they hit those pythons, they will get some auditory feedback as those two pythons kind of clank together. Um, sometimes you can even find the smaller ones so you don't have to hang um, such big ones together. Okay, measuring cups and spoons. Um, those are very simple to, to find in most kitchens and can be very useful for our kiddos. So measuring spoons, again, they are just another form of a rattle, um, especially if they're shiny or colorful in some way and the child 
sees them and wants them, they reach out, they grab them, and they're shaking them, pairing that lip and touch. Um, cups, whether they're measuring cups or just like colorful cups, you can use those for nesting, you can use those for stacking, um, you can also use those for some pouring and scooping activities. Okay, so now we'll move on to the tissue boxes. Um, so with this activity, um, this is going to encourage them to reach out for some scarves or whatever materials you have that you can put into a tissue box. So again, um, they use their vision, they reach out, they grasp it, they grasp the scarves, they pull the scarves out, they're tactually exploring, they're visually exploring, um, they're engaged in some purposeful play. Um, you can use a tissue box because it already has that opening. In this picture, um, it's not covered, but you can use their visually preferred color when we go back to those characteristics. I would probably wrap that tissue box with whatever color um, is my student's preference or even a shiny, like a shiny mylar paper to make it more attractive. Or you can even cheat and go to like a dollar store who has these shiny boxes already and you can buy them usually like in packs of three and they come and you can also use these boxes for like nesting and stacking. Just another little tidbit there. So those are nice. And then if you did want to put um, scarves in, you can just cut a slit in the lid and you have your um, scarf box already done for you. Uh, to replicate this activity, you could also use totes um, or laundry baskets as we have pictured here in the middle and on your right. Um, the tote and the laundry basket have holes in them already. And then you put different um, textured material poking through those holes and that encourages the child to use their vision to reach out and explore. As you can see the picture on the right, the little one um, is enjoying some tummy time and reaching for those different materials poking through the laundry basket. Okay, this activity is so simple. Um, I don't know about Julie, but I feel like this is probably one of my most favorite newest items in my like little bag. Plus I don't even, I mean, it's so cheap. Everybody can just make their own. So um, it's a scrunchie soccer glove. So all you have to do is find a, a sock. Uh, you can find a sock that's in your child or student's preferred color or a glove. I mean, again, going to the dollar store right now is, is fabulous because they have all of their, their children's gloves out there and just grab some, some good colored gloves or socks. And then you just need the Mylar paper or foil. And all you have to do is take some of that paper and fill the soccer glove and then you tie it, and then you just have your own little scrunchy, um, scrunchy sock or scrunchy ball. So this is actually a sock and that I've filled with mylar paper and then I've tied the end so it's like a little scrunchy ball. Um, so again, we're using your child's visual preferences, um, but we're, we're encouraging them to kind of get out of their comfort zone and, and reach out and tactually explore and engage in some cause and effect play. And, I don't know many kids that don't like this, like this crunchy sound. Um, I mean, I do have a few kids that it might startle at first, but most of them are really gravitated to the sound. So this is a great um, new little item that, that we've come across. All right, attribute trays. So attribute trays are a fantastic way to expand your child's visual um, repertoire as well. You can make attribute trays based on color. You can make attribute trays based on functional use or on objects. Um, it really encourages or really um, incorporates new skills such as concept development. We really work on concept development with attribute trays and it really encourages them to reach out and, and to actually explore and visually, visually explore what we have placed on these trays for them. So as we go from left to right, um, the image on the left is an attribute tray of slinkies. It's just a tray of slinkies. That's all it is. That's all this child's going to explore. 
And we have a red slinky, a rainbow slinky, and that's actually a doll slinky. Um, they're slinkies of different sizes. And then in the image in the middle is an attribute tray of balls. This is probably one of my favorites. Like, I think this is a fabulous attribute tray. <laughs> it's just amazing to look at. This has balls of different sizes, different colors, different textures. There's, you know, there's balls that have a bumpy texture, spiky texture. Um, I'm sure some of those even create some sound. So that's, an, that's just an example of an attribute tray of objects. And then we have another example on the right. It's an attribute tray of brushes. So you can have any brushes um, included on the attribute tray, like scrubbing brushes, hair brushes. Um, some have soft bristles, some have very hard bristles. Other ideas for tra attribute trays besides objects, you can make, like I mentioned, you can have attribute trays of just color, you know, putting um, ob different objects all of the same color. So maybe a red attribute tray. You could use bows. I've made attribute trays for bows plenty of times, or maybe items that bend or items with holes on them. Tin cans and coffee cans. Um, there's a lot we can make um, in phase two with just coffee cans or tin cans. Simply, um, one of the ones we'll start with is just simply making a drum out of them. Usually that shiny reflective surface is again going to gain their visual attention and encourage them to participate in something new. Simply turn the coffee can over and then find something within the home that they can use as mallets. So in the bottom right picture, <clears throat> excuse me, is just a coffee can. And those are miniature wooden spoons that I have in my kitchen and I can use those as their little drumsticks. We can also use coffee cans for that container play. Of course, they're a little deeper, so um, to encourage them to reach out down into a bigger container. Sure, Amy. Hi there. So Hi. this is a great opportunity just to kind of take a pause. These are wonderful ideas, and I just want you to know the chat box is alive with activity. But because we're right here on some of these, um, there are a couple of questions that maybe you can answer because, of course, people are going crazy and want to know how and where. So, first of all, uh, on one of your previous slides, where do you find a doll slinky? And then the follow-up question, too, is where do you buy all of your other slinkies? Okay, I will start with I buy all of my slinkies at the dollar store. Um, they have regular size slinkies, and then you can also get um, the smaller slinkies to two in one package. So I buy all of my slinkies at the dollar store. I am not sure where the slinky doll came from. I don't know if Julie can. Answer. I have a slinky Santa <laughs> that I got from the dollar store. <laughs> I don't. I don't have that exact slinky doll that's in the picture, but I have found slinky holiday items at the dollar store. So we just need to go to a dollar store and yeah. <laughs> to catch things. The only other question I have for you, Sarah, is on the previous slide where you had um, those, those trays that were set up. Were any of the items that you had attached to the tray or were they just laying on the tray? So the one um, here, I think I can, yeah. The one with the brushes, um, those are actually attached to the tray. You can see that tray is actually made out of pegboard. And so those are tied with some type of elastic so the child could reach, you know, and actually explore and bring those closer to their body. Um, these would be great if you had a child or student that was maybe a thrower, so they, you know, can't fling those across the room. So those can be attached. Um, the, the, time, the only other time I have attached items to an attribute tray besides using a pegboard would be like when I use our, or make an attribute tray of bows because I'm sticking those bows onto the different trays and I and I often use like a cookie sheet again I go to the dollar store and just buy cookie sheets and those are my attribute trays if you wanted to attach another option to attach is just by using velcro and that would just gonna say yeah. <laughs> I love velcro <laughs> Right, and that would encourage them and give them a little bit of hand strength or, or work on some hand strength as they pull those objects off of the tray. Great. Could you advance just one slide? I think it's the next one here. 
there are a few people who have asked the question about what is the material that you used on top of the cans in order to make uh, the drums? Oh yeah, well I hadn't gotten to that, but those are balloons, so we'll go ahead and answer. Those are actually balloons. So what you do is you cut off actually like the tail end of the balloon, and then you know then you can pull the rest of the the circular part of the balloon over and expand that over the drums and secure it with a rubber band. So I think that was all the questions. So I'll finish with my coffee cans. Um, I'm, Okay, Julie, I didn't know if you had something. No, I was just going to say, if you, anybody saw the comments, those pictures um, from Active Learning belong to Ellen Maisel, who was my teaching mentor. So she said where she got those items and how she made them. You see that in the chat. Okay. Okay, so. Ellen, please switch to all panelists and attendees so that people can see what you guys write. Otherwise, we're doing a lot of copying and pasting in your chat. Okay. All right, so I will go back to the tin cans using that as container play. Um, I think I was saying that sometimes those tin cans or coffee cans can be pretty big and deep. And we were saying that sometimes we like those shallower containers. I don't know if that's a word, but I just shallower, more shallow. Um, anyway, if you have a deep um, coffee can, um, I like to put a lighted source in the bottom to encourage them you know, to look down into the container and retrieve objects out and here is just um, a glow stick again dollar store you can buy multiple within a package and um, it's just a glow stick that or glow bracelet you can also use lighted wands clip lights um, i've also here recently with um, halloween coming up and the dollar store has all of the tea lights for the pumpkin so simply putting these little battery operated tea lights and something like that as well would promote some container play. We talked about the drums in the middle. Those are just made out of balloons, expanding the, the balloon over the top and securing it with a rubber band. And then on the left is just securing two or three metal cans inside. Again, you can put anything you want that will make some type of noise, those coins, that dried pasta, rocks, whatever it is, secure those cans together with some, um, glue or bands of some type that visual surface or that um, shiny surface is really uh, encourages them visually and then will motivate some reach and as they reach they roll that can back and forth and it will give them some auditory feedback very similar to those cans is a clorox can bead pull i use this a lot with my families it, it's just a, a white container um, I wrap mine with the Mylar paper, um, red for a particular child. This is their favorite. It's shiny, it's red, it really grabs their visual attention. Again, this encourages them to reach out and roll this can back and forth. I put beads in mine, so um, whether they're rolling or shaking it, they get auditory feedback. Then in addition, I actually poke a hole in top of my lid and then pull, um, or then have a, a bead string come down. So this encourages them to reach out and when they pull this, they'll get some type of auditory feedback as well. All right, I just have a couple more activities. Um, this one includes aluminum foil. Um, this is, uh, let's start with the picture on the left. Um, on the picture on the left, you can use mylar paper or aluminum foil. Just simply put it in a box and pair it with some type of lighted source. Again, you could use those glow sticks or a lighted toy or a lighted wand. This again uses their visual preferences, encourages them to reach out and explore what we have in the box. Um, the picture on the right is a picture of Julie's children, Jack and Mary, and they are engaged in foil painting. Um, we like to foil paint. You take a piece of foil, crumple it up into a ball, and then expand it back out so that, as you can see, it has all of those ridges and folds. Um, and then let them finger paint. If they don't like the finger paint on their fingers, you can use brushes, um, like Jack is here in this picture, or you could even do some vegetable or fruit sampling to include some more sensory, um, you know, into their into their play, and they could do some 
fruit and vegetables stamp painting onto the foil paint. But the idea is that, again, that reflective surface is getting their visual intention it's in, or, and it's encouraging them to participate um, in an activity. And as they're finger painting um, that crumpled foil, they are getting some tactile feedback as well. Okay, and the final activities I have to share is water. Um, we'll start with the picture on the right. This is Mary. She is just enjoying stirring um, water that Julie has dyed blue with food coloring. As you can see, she's placed the clear Tupperware roll on a white cutting board to help Mary be able to see the water better. Um, and I did ask, it just so happens that that light's coming in from the window. It wasn't intentional, it was just there, but <laughs> it might be gaining her attention as well. You can also use that Tupperware, you know, you can place a clear Tupperware bowl of water, colored water on the light box um, and let them play around with that too. The picture on the left is just a clear Tupperware bowl of water that I like have here. You put water in it and then I use those glow sticks. Um, and I put glow sticks in there and that encourages them to reach in and pick up those glow sticks. And for this particular activity, and you don't have to, and this comes from Active Learning, um, the Active Learning site, but placing water bands or rubber bands over that water dish, um, because then as they're playing with the water, and then if they run their hands across the rubber bands, they also get some auditory feedback again. So that is all of the activities I have to share in phase two. So now I'm going to kick it back over to Julie. Okay, so we're going to talk about books in phase three. We're really learning our literacy skills, but I just want to mention that everything we've done up to this point has been laying the foundation for literacy. So in phase one, we were helping your child have visual access to objects. And in phase two, as Sarah mentioned, they were interacting with objects. And so they're learning those concepts, what objects are, what are their properties, what can they be used for? Those concepts are what make books interesting and motivating and meaningful. So just know that up to this point, you've been laying the foundation and now we're starting to really have those first literacy experiences. Um, so when I think of literacy for a child with CVI, I go to Paths to Literacy. The link is here um, on the top of the slide. They have a page dedicated to CVI and they have examples of books for children in any phase. And they also give us the considerations that we need to be thinking of when we're creating books or adapting books for kids with CVI. So first, let's think about the CVI range score or any other assessment data that you have that will inform you of your child's visual functioning. Um, some things within that, within that data to look for or how much complexity can your child tolerate. So many mass produced books are extremely visually busy. There's so much going on. So how much of that complexity do we need to remove for our individual children? What is your child's power color or favorite color? You know, what motivates your child? What color motivates your child to, to look? And can your child process pictures or photos? This is a huge and important issue. Sometimes I think that, you know, we don't spend enough time thinking about this and talking about it. CBI is a perception issue. Perceiving 2D images is extremely challenging for children with CBI. So it's important to think about that, to understand that for your child. And if you aren't sure, spend some time pairing objects with images. Um, that's just an important part of this phase learning literacy, making that transition from 3D to 2D. Other considerations, what is your child's visual target? As I said, literacy should be meaningful. It should motivate your child because it's something that they're interested in. It's something they're familiar with. So what is your child's favorite object, activity, event, anything? Um, and just a few other points. We encourage you not to laminate because of glare. When you're thinking about a child trying to understand the details of an image, trying to understand those salient features, that glare really interferes with their ability to see them clearly. Um, you can, um, especially if you have a matte surface, use a flashlight or other light to highlight the pictures. And finally, you can use a visual anchor. You can use anything like a shiny sticker, a ribbon, just a colored area on a page that helps your child orient to the book. And then they can 
uh, scan the rest of the page once they've oriented to a particular page. And again, that's very individualized for each child. Okay, so let's just go right into homemade books. Yes? I'm trying, it's not advancing. Okay. Hold on. Okay, so again, these are from Paths to Literacy. They have so many great examples of books that you can make because as I mentioned, mass produced books are so busy and they don't often have concepts that our children with visual impairments can relate to. So sometimes it's best just to start from scratch. On the left, this book is called Three Little Pie Tins and a Red Pom Pom. So objects like Sarah had shown the pie tins earlier, they're objects that we use often in our lessons. So it's something that your child might be familiar with, something that has strong visual support properties, that shiny reflective property. Then we have the red, highly saturated color pom-pom. We have a black background. And you really can expand your idea of what a book is by looking at this example. There is a story. The little red pom-pom, he travels from one pie tin to the next. So then your child can then connect real objects from his or her life to a story. And that's what we want for those first literacy experiences. We want them to make those connections and understand why reading is enjoyable. In the middle is a book called My Favorite Things. And it is using photographs of a child's own personal toys, the favorite toys, of course, we wanna be motivating. And this book still has a lot of visual support, you know, the black background, one image per page, but we do have that increased complexity. That's a 2D image. If it were my session, I would also have that lighted slinky right there. I would have that object for the child to manipulate and compare the 3D object to the 2D photo in order to make that connection, in order to make that cognitive leap. The third book um, to the right is even more complex, but still has a lot of visual support. We still have the black background, we still have one main graphic per page, and it's shiny, it's bright gold, but we've added language. You know, the picture is much more abstract. It's not a photo, it's a drawing, basically. So we wanna help your child progress from real objects to those more complex drawings. But I just, I urge you not to hurry it and to make sure that they have that understanding going from 3D to 2D. You can also adapt existing books. Brown Bear, Brown Bear, it's a favorite for many of us, teachers of the visually impaired. It's already fairly visually simple, but if you wanna make it even more appropriate for a child with CVI, you can take similar images. If you just do a Google search, you can find images that are similar to those in Brown Bear, Brown Bear and print them out and affix them to a black background. And you can also highlight. So the red bird, he has some red mylar as a visual anchor to highlight him. Um, the yellow duck is pairing an object with the picture in order to, again, work on that connection be between 3D and 2D images. Clifford, the book on the right, he has a little bit of mylar to highlight him as well. And again, it's just still very simple, but these images are more abstract. So we wanna add that support. And now I wanna talk about digital books. So we need to always remember our goal. As I said in the very beginning, think about what we're working on. If our goal is to help a child with CVI perceive digital, to perceive 2D images, digital images are the sharpest and crispest and clearest and they're backlit and so they give us all of that great support and it's really hard to find anything that's more appropriate in terms of a 2d image so i you know i do use digital books with my students um, i do love to get their hands on a 3d book but again we're remembering our goal if this is our goal we're gonna sometimes want to think about using digital books on the bottom is a link to uh, the Paths to Technology Resource Library. And um, Leanne, I apologize, I didn't put this in the chat earlier. I'll have to do that or maybe Sarah can do that for me. Um, there is a resource library of ready-made digital books. So, and several of these are appropriate for children with CVI. Very simple, um, solid color backgrounds, objects that you can find in your house. One of my favorite is called Vegetables. Oops, I wasn't done yet. That's okay. Um, and so you could just pull those out of your refrigerator and do that 3D to 2D comparison there. Um, but it's even more appropriate if you use photos of your child's own favorite objects. So you can make your own digital book. And just to mention, Paths to Technology does have articles on just walking you right through that, how you can make your own digital book for your child and make it appropriate for a child with CVI. 
So as I said, using those favorite objects, we're using that familiarity, objects that have already been visually processed, objects that your child has handled, and they might understand the concept of that object. So these are the most powerful in terms of helping them make that leap from 3D to 2D. You can just use the photo album on your phone. You could use PowerPoint or Keynote or iBooks, whatever format you like. But one thing to remember and focus on is to simplify the images. And one way that you can do that is by using UDoodle. So my favorite app for simplifying images, you can either simplify a paper book and make it into a digital book, or you can use existing digital images and make them more supportive um, for a child with CBI. So this was a book that my student loved the movie Aladdin and we wanted to read this Aladdin book, but it was just too busy, just too much going on, all of that text in the middle, very visually distracting. And we just wanted to look at the image of Aladdin. So I took a photo of the paper book, I imported the image into UDoodle. If, if I didn't mention, it's a free app and it's in iOS and in Android, available for iOS and Android. Um, so I took a picture of it, I downloaded it into UDoodle, and then I cut out very poorly the image of Aladdin, changed the background to all black, and then I highlighted him in yellow. You can have whatever color background you want, you can have whatever color highlight you want. So individualize it for your child. Another idea is if you could take an existing photo, let's say you have a photo of your child doing something, you're making one of those great experience books about my child's walk in the park, and you have a picture of your child with a flower, but there's everything going on in the background. It's too busy. You could import that photo into UDoodle, just cut out the image of your child and the flower and make a black background and highlight it. And it's so much more appropriate for your child to understand and perceive that image when it has those supports. Okay. So in closing, we've given you a lot to think about today, but what we want you to remember more than anything is that motivation is the key. You have to know what motivates your child. And as parents, you have that great gift of knowing your child better than anyone else. So use that and choose activities that your child will be interested in. This photo, it's Mary again, um, in the apple orchard. And she, you know, she was struggling with consistent fixations. This is when she was about three, but she was so motivated to get that apple that I don't know if you can tell she is looking right at it and she eventually reached out and got it. So always use motivation, but also remember your goal. As parents, we try to do a lot at once. Sometimes we multitask and sometimes that's too much for our children with CBI. So we need to just focus on what our goal is for a particular activity. Are we trying to provide visual access? Are we trying to integrate vision into motor activities? Are we trying to interpret 2D images and build those literacy skills? Or are we using other senses to learn? And I just want to give you permission as a teacher and as a parent that you don't have to work on vision all the time, all day, every day. Um, your child has six pathways to learning, the five senses plus movement. Many times we eliminate all other sensory complexity for our children and then we're losing five pathways to learning. So we need to balance throughout the day, giving our children time to learn concepts in a multi-sensory way. Finally, we wanna make sure that we are matching the toy or activity to your child's visual functioning. So go back to that assessment data, look at those characteristics, think about which ones are important to your child and how you can modify activities to make them appropriate for your child. And that will build success so that your child can keep looking and keep learning. You have lots of questions. Are you ready? <laughs> Did you want to show the slide? This is just our contact information. We welcome you to contact us. I, Sarah and I say we often do this after a seminar, like an hour later, we'll have a question. So if you do, feel free to email us or contact us with that. And while I'm starting to answer questions or ask you questions, feel free to drop those in the chat, both of you, so that they have those uh, handy. You can't cut and paste from a um, presentation. It doesn't work that way. Um, so the first one is, is it okay? or would you believe it's okay to laminate with a matte finish? I have not had a whole lot of success with that. I, I've had a mom use hodgepodge or Mod Podge. It's like a craft scrapbook, a fixing material, um, but I have not had any success with that. I don't know, Sarah, have you? I honestly don't get the opportunity 
to use you noodle notch. So unfortunately I can't. <laughs> She's talking about laminating. Oh, laminate. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking. I don't laminate much either just because of the glare. Um, so I try not to use lamination. Yeah. Have you ever seen a matte laminate? It's a slightly less shiny, but yeah. there is still a reflective yeah, you can, feature to because, it. Yeah, you can because I have a laminator and it, you can go and buy like the shiny or like a matte cover. So you can based on what you're wanting. Okay. If that's a, yeah, if you have it, I'm assuming someone has a personal laminator, right? That's what they're asking. So I think they're asking if the matte finish uh, reduces the glare uh, if they're choosing laminate. I would say to some degree, I think it also depends how, um, what, what word am I looking at? Like, how reactive are they are to glare? I mean, it's not going to take away all of the glare, depending how much light's coming through, but I think it would definitely help some. Maybe just that individual um, visual functioning question, though, like how much can your child tolerate of, you know, with that glare? Can they see the images clearly enough with that material? Okay. Okay. And um, I also you, think, okay. I'm sorry, and I also think it, you know, how you control the environment in general to reduce that glare, you know, make sure you're closing all the windows or, you know, reducing all the natural light that you can, turning them away from the light. I mean, that's all going to help as well. Can you speak to how you assess students to understand how they orient to a page? Oh, okay. I can go first. Um, when I am looking at a child reading a book, I will try it in several different positions. So it, as you know, we're birth to three teachers. So we're, when we're doing assessments, they're very little babies. Um, so we're looking for, are they scanning the page? Are they spending time on just one page or the other? You know, do they need to have it in a certain position? You know, I love slant boards um, for that good posture and for having, you know, that more of an even distance between the different parts of the page instead of always looking down. So, um, I mean, sometimes we do, we have the page off to the side to the strongest visual, visual field, but I mean, it's just behavioral. I'm just looking, is the child alerting? Are they attending? And then, you know, looking at their body language, are they enjoying the experience of reading? You had a book with a red bird and a duck. What was the clear covering on that? So that's from the Paths to Literacy webpage. I would have to <laughs> refer you to that webpage um, to see what they used there. Okay. We did. We made something very similar in our conference last year, but we didn't have any covering on it at all. We our mm -hmm. last year our conference was in person and not virtual, so we did that exact project. <laughs> um, yeah, and we just had black construction paper that our families used, and we didn't have any kind of covering on it. Okay. Can any of these items be useful for purposeful movement like walking or like crawling or walking to the item? I, I think the, um, well, I think any of them are, if they're motivating. I think you can use a lot of the auditory cues or like when you pair light, you know, inside of a coffee can, if that's motivating and really encourages them to, to crawl or move. Um, towards that can. Um, I have had children roll or crawl to that crunchy sound of the Mylar paper. Um, so I definitely think they can all be used for motivational purposes for more movement. We have some people in the chat actually sharing that there is a spray that you can do, use to reduce glare on lamination. I don't know it, but it sounds like it might be something to look into depending on your student again. I'm trying. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a question regarding uh, working with students while we are handling COVID. So with distance learnings, are you as teachers taking materials to homes for the caregivers to use and then watch them virtually? What, what, what strategies are you using? Do you want to start, um, Sarah? Yeah, I've been doing some porch drop-offs of materials. Um, you know, if the families don't have items in the home, um, then, and I think Julie's been doing the same thing. So we do um, drop off some materials to homes so that we can then work with them virtually, but they have the materials and replicate what we're asking them to do. 
Yeah, so typically when I have a, an appointment with a family, when I send them their Zoom invite, I'll say, do you have any of these materials in your house, things that I might want to work on? And then that's kind of how we structure our lesson. And if, you know, a, a couple weeks, a couple sessions go by and the families aren't able to have, you know, any of the common materials that we use, then I'll start porch dropping. <laughs> Let's go on a little drive. Okay, um, going along with the, during the pandemic, um, are you having difficulty getting light boxes to families or what is your suggestion for light boxes during the pandemic? Well, we gave the suggestion of a homemade light box, you know, for those of us who, you know, some, some of them are still, some of my light boxes are still out um, for families who would have returned them, but we, you know, we understand that if they're not comfortable exchanging them now, that's fine. So yeah, we are having kind of a little light box shortage. <laughs> so we are encouraging families to make homemade light boxes. And I think Sarah shared that you can make them really simply. They don't have to be fancy at all. And you can kind of, you can individualize them. There are lots of ways you can make one. Right, I was, we, Julie and I were talking the other day and I know she shared some instructions for a homemade light box. I mean, I've simply had families that have just gotten a clear container some white light, they put that in the clear container, they, you know, create a little hole, to, you know, so that they can push the cord through to plug it in and they have a light box. So very simple, it can be very simple, simple. There was an earlier picture where you actually showed a uh, plastic bin with a yep. light in it. Do you know what type of light they were using in that? That was a rope light. Or rope how light. about yours, Sarah? Mine was a rope light. <laughs> Right, yeah, um, you can use just like Christmas lights. Um, I prefer rope lights because they don't get hot. Um, so they can stay on for extended periods of time and you don't have to worry about um, them getting hot, especially to if it's something outside of the light box. We use rope lights a lot to encourage some reach. And of course we wouldn't want them to you know, reach for anything that's hot and dangerous. So I prefer rope lights. And the great thing about rope lights too, is you can get them in solid colors. So like you could get them all red, mm -hmm. white obviously would be best for the light box, but if you wanted um, to incorporate those into other activities, you could get red, blue, or green. Yeah, and they're not expensive. I just got my Costco ad today and there's some on sale for $15. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for positioning in the light box, especially for students in Riften chairs or wheelchair? So what I like, um, especially for like APH's light box, I prefer the minis, the mini light boxes, because those fit pretty well on the trays. Um, you know, if there's a tray that accompanies the, the standard or wheelchair or activity chair, um, those fit well right on there. If they don't have a tray, but they are like in a wheelchair, um, putting, pushing them up to like a table and putting the smaller light box right up on the table is a good a good height. Julie, did you have any? Yeah, I was just encouraged to just think about what other positions might be possible for using the light box. So say you're a family that only has a large light box. Like I mentioned my little guy in, who spends time in prone and he does great using his vision in that position. So just think about other positions that you might be using throughout the day. Maybe, you know, collaborate with the PT. And, you know, those might be comfortable positions for visual attention. Mm -hmm. A couple of links in the chat for light boxes. Sorry, Amazon <laughs> gives huge links when you're in there for what a light box is, for, for a light rope it is what it is. Um, so that helps with our positioning. Have you had any um, uh, assistance with uh, financially purchasing these items? How does your school district or entity work? Okay, so, <laughs> so we are fortunate in that um, we are able to request, um, you know, our school, our agency to purchase light boxes for our use with families and to kind of loan to them um, while, we're, while we are providing them services. Um, I have also, within the Early Intervention Program, now granted we're Illinois Early Intervention Program, and this does seem to vary among different CFCs, but while they're in EI, I have been successful in ordering light boxes for families through like an AT request um, so that they have their own when it comes to transition time, then I'm able to take ISDIs back and then the family then has their own moving forward. 
Yeah, and I saw a question come up about this stuff in the dollar store. Yeah, we just buy that. <laughs> we just buy it. <laughs> oh, I know. Somebody said, how do you fund? Yeah. Um, I yeah. Out of our pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just um, easier to cut through that I'm, red tape, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> sometimes it is easier, yes. Red, red tape sometimes is. I think that's something we all experience as, as teachers. That's part of what we do. Is there, I, I was trying really hard to pay attention to questions in the chat. So if I missed your question, please put it again and I apologize. Um, there were quite a few coming through at the same time and at that point I kind of lost a hair of those questions. So please uh, feel free to put your question in the chat. I us. saw one come up about eye gaze, and I'd really actually love to answer that. Go for it. Sorry, um, you, I, I, I thought I saw another one too. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. So right. can you tell I me who the have question student, was? Excuse me. What was the question? Just in case other people. Um, do you have experience with children with CVI using eye gaze technology? And I do. I have. I have one student who's using eye gaze, and you know we that was recommended for her without my input. Um, because I think that you also, besides just visual functioning, you think you need to think of cognitive overall developmental level, you know, so vision involves visual perception involves your cognitive skills, you know, involves so many things. It's not just your, you know, your, the function of your visual pathways It is how you understand based on your overall developmental level. So, you know, I think a child needs to be at that developmental threshold where they can understand pictures with or without a visual impairment, just that baseline understanding and for me that's at least 24 months that's my personal you know not I'm not quoting any textbook just my own experience so my child that I'm working with is younger than that and so we're struggling so that's that's my answer another question regarding page orientation can you explain how you chose to place stickies oh stickers stickers you want to go Sarah um, I mean, again, I really just base it off that child's preference and where their visual field is. Um, so I think it takes, um, you know, a lot of background knowledge about, about your student or your child where to best um, present materials, and that includes stickers um, on a page or any, any type of adaptations on the page that, that you may need to modify a book. I, um, I gave those, some of those examples, they have the highlighting right on the object. So if you saw like Clifford and the red bird, the, the anchor is right there on the object. But I've also seen some examples and there are some, there's at least one book on that past te technology resource library. There's a red square in the corner of each page. So it's consistent for every single page that child knows there's going to be that red square in that top right hand corner. And then I can scan the rest of the page. So it really is individualized you know, based on the assessment data for a particular child. I know both of you work with young children, um, for maybe your oldest of your young children. Um, do you have any recommendations for helping a child to visually attend to teachers if they're actually online, if they're online presenting? I know your students are very young, so they might not even be attending. <laughs> well, for myself, I mean, these are things that I, 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 I'm just going to call this old school, like red fireman's hat, you know, clown nose, just big silly glasses, anything that will make you stand out visually and then just keep yourself simple, like your clothing, mm -hmm. you know, keep your background simple so that they can notice you better. Um, but yeah, I would, I would wear the big red fireman's hat and see if that helped. <laughs> I was going to say, or, you know, we've asked people to like, they can wrap their head in a scarf or, you know, something just to kind of, um, isolate you know their face a little bit but I second really paying attention more to the background um, and what they're wearing. Okay trying to see if there was anything else in here. Um, lots of people sharing ideas with one another so we have seen uh, quite a bit of sharing going on and I think that's where we are right now making sure that we're we're giving the opportunity to share with one another and gather some of this information. Uh, many of the links that were in the chat, just to let you know, those will actually go out in the follow-up email. So you will get all of those in the follow-up email and I will make it so that the presentation can be downloaded. I think I just did a view only. That was an accident on my part. And I can get that fixed and switched out uh, when we do the um, link uh, inside the follow-up email. So do look for that. 
Let's see if there's any other questions coming in. Uh, when is the APH mini light box to be available? You do see it sold out. Uh, we are in slight back order. Uh, the brand new ones sold out quite quickly. We do have another batch that I know of coming in. I can't tell you exactly one. Please feel free to email cs at aph.org or give them a phone call and ask. The uh, customer service would definitely be able to tell you when. I do know we have another shipment coming in. I it have heard in the end of October, <laughs> perhaps into November for those, okay. but that's, um, you know, approximate. Yeah, I, I do know that they were ordered. It has nothing to do with us not wanting to get them out. COVID right. does, did cause some hiccups for us um, getting the things that we needed out. That's right. Thanks a lot, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, before I let uh, you go, I, I want to say thank you so very much, uh, Sarah and Julie. I have a feeling we need to do this again, so you'll have to get your brain going for all of the different items that you have in your head. We loved learning all of this information. Absolutely. Awesome. And if I may too, uh, I, I would invite those of you who have more questions or suggestions on topics that you would like uh, in a similar vein, you can email us at the Connect Center at uh, Connect Center at APH.org. Connect Center mm -hmm. at APH.org. We are grant funded and we appreciate uh, your feedback uh, as if this was helpful to you in any area uh, relating to you know, a family connect, uh, children, uh, adults, seniors, and or job seekers. Uh, it's basically running the entirety of life. Anything that you think we are missing information on, we'd like to hear from you as well. And again, I would like to thank uh, Sarah and Julia as well. You're very knowledgeable and obviously very good at what you do. And thanks again for helping us out with that. Yes, thank you so much for, for doing this. And we will be working closely together, continuing on from here because we are we are working on an EI BI uh, webinar series. So um, you'll be seeing a lot of Sarah and Julia <laughs> in the next, you know, coming up in the next year. <laughs> this the rest of this year and the next year and hopefully for a lot longer than that. So um, we're really excited that uh, that they're a part of of APH and and trying to help us help families. So this is great. Thank you so much. Oh my God, the chat was just totally exploding while you guys were <laughs> while you guys were going. So <laughs> there's a lot of information, a lot of interest in this.